I therefore had to be satisfied with watching him as closely as I could, but I could see nothing suspicious about his actions. However, as rumours about him were growing and becoming more widespread, I decided to try to see this stranger myself, and I began to hunt regularly in the neighbourhood of his grounds. For a long time I watched without finding an opportunity. At last it came to me, in the shape of a partridge, which I shot and killed, right in front of the Englishman. My dog fetched it for me. Taking the bird, I went at once to Sir John Rowell, and, begging his pardon, asked him to accept it. He was a big man, with red hair and beard, very tall, very broad, a kind of calm and polite Hercules. He had nothing of the so-called British stiffness, and in a broad English accent he thanked me warmly for my attention, and at the end of the month we had had five or six conversations. One night, at last, as I was passing before his door, I saw him in the garden, seated astride a chair, smoking his pipe. I bowed, and he invited me to come in and have a glass of beer. I needed no persuading. He received me with the most punctilious English courtesy, sang the praises of France and of Corsica, and declared that he was quite in love with this country. Then, with great caution and under the guise of a vivid interest, I asked him a few questions about his life and his plans. He answered me without embarrassment, telling me that he had travelled a great deal in Africa, in the Indies and in America. He added, laughing, I have had many adventures. Then I turned the conversation on to hunting, and he gave me the most curious details of hunting, the hippopotamus, the tiger, the elephant, and even the gorilla. I said, Are these dangerous animals? He smiled, Oh, no! Man is the worst, and he laughed a good broad laugh, the wholesome laugh of a contented Englishman. I have also frequently been man-hunting. Then he began to talk about weapons, and he invited me to come in and see different makes of guns. His parlour was draped in black, black silk embroidered in gold, Big yellow flowers, as brilliant as fire, were worked into the dark material. He said, It is a Japanese material. But in the middle of the widest panel, a strange thing attracted my attention. A black object stood out against a square of red velvet. I went up to it. It was a hand, a human hand not the clean white hand of a skeleton, but a dried black hand with yellow nails, the muscles exposed and traces of old blood on the bones, which were cut off as clean as though it had been cut off with an axe, near the middle of the forearm, round the wrist, an enormous iron chain, riveted and soldered to this unclean member, fastened it to the wall by a ring strong enough to hold an elephant in leash. I asked, What is that? The Englishman answered quietly, That is my best enemy. It comes from America. The bones were severed by a sword and the skin cut off with a sharp stone dried in the sun for a week. I touched these human remains, which must have belonged to a giant. The uncommonly long fingers were attached by enormous tendons, which still had pieces of skin hanging from them in places. This hand was terrible to see. It made one think of some savage vengeance. I said, this hand must have been very strong. 
the Englishman answered quietly. Yes, but I was stronger than he. I put on this chain to hold him. I thought that he was joking at the time. I said, This chain is useless now. The hand won't run away. Sir John Rowell answered seriously, It always wants to go away. This chain is needed. I glanced at him quickly, questioning his face, and I asked myself, is he an insane man or a practical joker? But his face remained inscrutable, calm and friendly. I turned to another subject and admired his rifles. However, I noticed that he kept three loaded revolvers in the room, as though constantly in fear of some attack. I paid him several calls. Then I did not go any more. People had become used to his presence. Everybody had lost interest in him. A whole year rolled by. One morning, toward the end of November, my servant awoke me and announced that Sir John Rowell had been murdered during the night. 